Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Joining us on the line is Professor Brian Keating, cosmologist at the University of California, San Diego, which means he studies the stars. He's not a cosmetologist, which is like the person who does makeup. He's also the author of the best-selling memoir, Losing the Nobel Prize. His latest book is his newest book, Think Like a Nobel Prize Winner. Brian, thanks so much for joining the show. Great to talk to you. Yeah, it's good to see you again, Ben. So let's talk about this uh, amazing stuff that we're getting now from the Webb Telescope. So first of all, what is the Webb Telescope and why should we care other than it makes pretty pictures? <laughs> well, it does a lot more than that. It's uh, it's a $10 billion investment, probably the most complicated object human beings have ever shot off into space. And it's located a million miles away from Earth. It's actually four times the distance to the moon. And its job is really to peer back almost to the beginning of time, not quite to the beginning of time. That's my that's my domain. They're not allowed to go back all the way to the beginning, but they're allowed to look at, and their goal is to look at the earliest structures that ever formed in the universe, that's one major topic, to look at galaxies, the first stars that formed, to see if the edifice on which all of modern science stands upon, which is which is based on our origin of the universe, if there is good, solid uh, framework for it. And also, in so doing, these, these photons, these particles of light traverse the universe, and they encode the properties of the universe as it's evolved since the origin of time, including relatively nearby objects by our standards, things that are only a few thousand light years away. And those are called exoplanets. Those are other planets, perhaps just like the earth that could potentially harbor forms of life. And, uh, and that, and that's a, you know, what if they have a, you know, competitor podcast to, to, to you, Ben. So we want to make sure that everyone out there is uh, fully apprised of all the latest happenings. So this telescope is really a culmination of, of decades of work. It's way over budget, way over time, but it really does what nothing else can do, which is, which is to peer back and give us a glimpse into our cosmic origins. And so Brian, I watched a video where you're talking about this telescope and obviously you spent your life making telescopes and, and, and monitoring telescopes. So the, what, what amount of complexity went into this? And also, I mean, how high was the risk here? Because this is out in the middle of nowhere. If something is broken on this thing, you're basically screwed and you just sent $10 billion worth of hardware in, into, into just space for no reason. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this this had so many what we call single point failure risks where any one individual problem could compromise the whole $10 billion mission, whether that could be blowing up on the launch pad or not being able. This telescope is so big and so wide, it could not be launched in its final configuration and had to be unfolded uh, and unpacked like origami. And I have some animations on my YouTube channel of that process. And that is a technological hurdle, not just because you're building something in space with no astronauts nearby to service it as you said it's a it's it's uh you know thousands of times farther away than the hubble the hubble te space telescope is actually closer to us than than you and i are right now and in other words the hubble space is only 250 miles above the earth this is you know, this is a million miles away. So no chance of repair, no, no, no service stations out there in space. And so this had to work, it had to work it, it had to work the, the right time, the first time and with no opportunity for repair. So, uh, and it also had to be unfolded and the mirrors aligned to a precision less than the diameter of a human hair. And so that uh, that is just astounding accomplishment. And there were many times when it could have been canceled, and it could have been. Um, and, and and some astronomers, rightfully, I have to you know mention it. Some astronomers didn't think they should continue with it because it did kind of swallow NASA's budget. But now that it's out there, you know, you forgot about the uh, the birthing pains of of the of the baby, and now it's doing this phenomenal science as of as of just this week. So, what is the the sort of program for the telescope? How long is it supposed to sit out there before it it is out of range? or degrades or does it sort of stay in like, how does it stay out there how do we communicate with it and uh, and what do we expect to get from it in terms of data yeah so it's it's pretty amazing it's it's not orbiting like the moon orbits around the the earth and the earth orbits around the sun this object is orbiting around a blank piece of space it's basically trailing behind the sun uh earth and moon by a distance of as i said a million miles away from the earth so it it's, it's kind of this amazing uh, point in space called the Lagrange point for you aficionados out there. I know your audience is the second smartest in the universe, except for my audience. Uh, and this, this object has to maintain that precision called station keeping for hopefully two decades or more. There's really almost no limitation on its lifetime. It's shielded 
from the brutal conditions of space by this very thin mylar balloon-like material. Material, and that blocks enough light and heat that it can remain cold. These cameras are not seeing light like you and I are looking at each other right now. They're seeing infrared radiation, which is slightly longer wavelength, which is not visible to the human eye. So it's revealing things that Hubble could not see, and it will do so for two decades. So you've obviously had you know, a, a rich amount of time to study these photos. I mean, you've had you've had all of like 24 hours to, to look at these photos. So explain the secrets of the universe. So what exactly has been confirmed here i mean obviously they, they've talked about the the curvature of, of space time and and the and the sort of confirmation of einsteinian theories of relativity um but what what are some of the earliest things that we've learned yeah, it's interesting. So yeah, of course, the data just came out a, a few you know, hours ago when the time we're talking, but, but we kind of had a hint at what they would be looking at. And of course, Hubble's been up for a long, for 30 years now. And so it was able to, you know, kind of provide a finder scope view of what these objects would look like. Again, different wavelengths, different science. So what these five images that they released really do portend for the future of this, of this mission uh, is quite astounding. Uh, we'll be able to look at the effects of gravity on distant objects. And gravity is the most pervasive force in the universe. It's the one I use as an excuse why I don't go to the gym for the last 30 years. But this, uh, but gravity is the most dominant force, and yet it's the weakest force. You don't think about that when you're at the gym pumping iron, but, uh, but it's actually the weakest force. So therefore, it can have the longest range. It can reach out across the entirety of the universe and affect the properties of massive clusters and stars. And what we're most interested in, I think, with Webb are, are really two or three different main topics. One is the effects on the early universe. How did the early universe assemble the star? Which came first, the star or the galaxy? In other words, how do we know what the uh, elemental building blocks are of astronomy? We actually don't have a great idea for that. What is the nature of dark matter and dark energy? Dark matter and dark energy, Ben, make up 95% of the universe's mass and energy, and we have no clue whatsoever what they are. And, and then the third thing that many people are, are, are really interested in, and I, I kind of aped you and, and, and did a Brian Keating Reacts video, uh, you know, just, there was less, you know, woke tears and there weren't so many libs of TikTok on it. But, uh, but nevertheless, I did a reaction to what I'm most interested in is the search for life in the universe, because I'm actually a life uh, a pessimist. I don't believe that there's life elsewhere in the universe, but no one would be more thrilled than I to discover that there is life in the universe. And what, what, what Webb can do and what it released, just a tantalizing hint of an object that we know doesn't have life on it. Uh, it's, a, it's an object, you know, something like half the size of Jupiter, the planet Jupiter, and it's cruising around a star every three days. So it's getting pretty toasty, a little toastier than, than down there in Florida. But, uh, but the object has so much so strong atmospheric lines that it can actually demonstrate the properties of water. And many scientists think that water is a necessary uh, ingredient, not sufficient, but necessary ingredient for life to be supported. Again, I'm not so sanguine that there is life in the universe. There's zero evidence for life elsewhere in the universe, but that would make me the most surprised and excited to find out that it's true. And so Webb has this unique ability that even my powerful telescopes that my colleagues and I are building, we have no ability to do that. So Webb is unique in that sense. Well, that's Brian Keating. He, of course, is the author of Losing the Nobel Prize, and his latest book is Think Like a Nobel Prize Winner. Brian, thanks so much for the insight on this stuff. It really is amazing and fascinating. And if you're a religious person, it confirms your belief that there is a God in the universe. If you're not religious, then, you know, science is cool. Brian, really <laughs> appreciate the time. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic.